Hello, whoever said hello, thank you. Um, so one of my most favorite things about the cybersecurity industry is just the sheer talent that exists in it. And kind of that's been, I've been reminded of that again today, going around chatting with people that I've never met before, or I've met before. Um, and it's really, really awesome. But the thing that really bugs me about the cybersecurity industry is a lot of those extremely talented people enter the industry and I don't think they really maximize on, on their capabilities. They, they do some good solid stuff, but perhaps sometimes struggle to really shape the direction of perhaps where the industry should go. So part of the reason I've stood up here today is because I really want to share any advice or, or guidance that perhaps I've learned in my time in the industry to, to maybe help some people really maximize that and perhaps give a, a bit of an outlook on, on yeah, how, how you can succeed at cybersecurity and do some great things. So success, broadly speaking, it's, it's about outcomes. It's about achieving those outcomes. If you achieve those outcomes, that's some success. Sometimes there's quite an emphasis on results, numbers, measures, those type of things. And, and often what you'll find is those, those stifle or, or limit creativity. So I'll give you a little bit, bit of a story on this. At my previous company, we were, we were quite a successful company. We were growing quite, quite rapidly. And each year, we'd calculate how much we wanted to grow. So let's say we wanted to grow 40% or whatever. That in itself... Isn't, isn't an outcome, that's a, re that, that's a result. And, and I guess where I never wanted to be is in a situation whereby, as managing director of the business, I was turning around to the business and going, guys, this year we've got some really exciting stuff we're going to crack on and do. We are going to grow the business by 40%. Because to technical people, that's not exciting. No one's going to be motivated by that. I've got a team of awesome technical individuals and my message to them is this year we're going to do some awesome stuff, we're going to grow 40%. Because to them, that feels, well, that's just hard work, that's effort, we're going to do more of the same, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we always used to do was to not hide that fact, but the growth of 40% is the result of doing something. So if we're cracking on and doing some awesome stuff in cybersecurity, you know what the result of that's going to be? We're going to grow, we're going to grow 40%. So one thing I'd like for you to do throughout this presentation is to try and keep your heads in that headspace and focus on the outcomes because if you achieve those outcomes, the results just happen and actually you don't need to worry too much about them. So if you're going to grow a business or succeed at something, you might look to you know, what rev revenue growth, growth as a measure, but that's the result of doing something else and it's that something else that I want us to focus on, on a little bit uh, today. Uh, who am I? So I started my career in the industry back in 2006, I think, as a, a lowly intern at a company called MWR, uh, where I became a techie, did some pen testing, uh, that type of thing, did a bunch of work, pushed out through MWR labs, presented at conferences and bits and pieces. Then I became manager, managing director of the business. We got bought by F-Secure. I became a member of the Crest Executive Probably several of you voted for me to be on that executive. I, I did some time with Crest. Uh, and then more recently, I moved over to JumpSec, where we're doing some fun stuff in cybersecurity there. I've got more CVs than I can remember. That used to be the world's fastest supercomputer. And just before they went live, they had to fix a critical issue that I'd found with the technology they were using. Otherwise, it would have got popped. That's one of the previous fastest supercomputers and still my favorite supercomputer. Whilst that was live, they had to rush fix a critical security issue that I'd found in it. Because that's my topic area, playing with fancy tech like that. But actually, the things I want to share with you today, some of it's come from me. I, I think I've had a reasonably OK career. But I've had the opportunity to work with some super, super smart people. So what I've tried to do today is collate a whole bunch of things I've learned from working with those people to maybe share it back with you and see if there's anything that we can kind of learn from it, replicate, do more of. Um, so when I first started in, in the industry, I was working with, with people like Luke Jennings, who wrote this paper on Windows access tokens. And anyone who was around in 2008 will know that that pretty much fundamentally changed the way we do pen testing. And if you've used anything like Mimikatz or anything more recent, you know what, it's all drawn from that research. Uh, teams I've worked with have created great tooling that 
some of you may have used, some of you may have heard of. I've been involved in some awesome training events to develop teams, develop people. Uh, teams I've run and, and worked with have one pwn to own, again, more times than I can remember, compromising fully patched Windows systems running Chrome. Most of the Samsung Galaxy series of phones, Samsung loved us an awful lot. Um, this is the guys down at the bottom. We've played pin pad racer on chip and dip pin devices. We've also played Flappy Birds on MPOS devices. And we've spoken at many, many conferences throughout the world. So collectively, I think there's a lot of great things that these people have done. And I just spent a little bit of time over the last few weeks collating some of what I've learned from working with those people to, to share with you today. And really, my reason for sharing that is because I really think Crest companies are special. You've got super talented people within you, and there's a sheer breadth of knowledge. But I think for a little while, our voice has been a little bit quiet, a little bit... Mm, and actually, I think to the buying market, it's perhaps come across a little bit as more of the same. And I want to change that a little bit. To give you an example of, of uh, well, a real example of that, a few years back, I think, Crest started to create focus groups. So for the different streams like Pentest, IR, TI, there'd be focus groups. And I think that's a really great thing because we're going to bring from the members all of their experience and knowledge and shape something. So a great move by Crest, in my opinion. And I remember being at one of the, the early Pentest focus group meetings, and the topic area was, well, what should a Crest Pentest be? And it was a good question to be asking. And I sat there thinking, well, I used to do pen testing. There's all these things I think are just a waste of time. We should stop doing those. There's all these things that we're not doing. We should definitely do those. Like, this is an opportunity to really point pen testing in a new direction, exciting place. And we concluded that it should be a Crest pen test, should be a pen test, but it should have certified Crest people on it. And it's things like that where I feel there's great intent but there's a missed opportunity because we're constraining ourselves. And we're constraining ourselves a little bit based upon the rules that we as an industry have all already created. Um, and at the moment, I spend a lot of time chatting with, with the, the buying market, with buyers. And at the moment, there's, there's kind of a situation whereby they're spending an awful lot on cybersecurity. They're investing in lots of different technologies, teams, developing capability here, there, wherever but they're really taking a good hard look at what they've done and asking the question, was it worth it? Is that investment actually paying off? Is it worth the money that we're investing in it? And they're actually right now really actively looking for something a little bit new, something a little bit different, because I don't think they're feeling they're getting that value from that investment. It's a little bit like if you've got a Formula One car. You know what, Formula One car, I've had a Formula One car. I probably couldn't even get it out my driveway. But stick a Formula One driver in it and a team of mechanics, and actually you've probably got something really special, something really, really capable. But if all you want to do is the weekly shop with your wife and two kids, like a Formula One car is not the right tool for the job. Um, and, and, and this is a thing that's kind of there in the industry. We've got people who've invested in lots of cutting edge tech that perhaps isn't the right thing for them, but it ticked all of the boxes on the, the kind of requirements list. So over the, like, the coming years, I think there's a real opportunity for us as Crest member companies to really step forward and lead that narrative. But there's things that we've got to do in order to, to do that. The market's looking for it, and if we don't do it, someone else will. So my, my ask would be that, that we as an industry do do it. But like I said, part of our challenge is we're quite driven by rules and constraints. And these are rules and constraints that we have created, um, but they're, they're kind of holding us back. What this is, is, so I mentioned previously I've been involved in some training exercises and activities. What this is, is we called it the plugboard challenge. It's plugboard from one of the training events that, that we ran. And on the left-hand side, you've got symbols, and on the right-hand side, you've got the colors. And you had a whole bunch of leads, and you'd plug into one side of the board and connect to the other side of the board. And on the screen, you got a set of just different criteria. And every lead you plugged in from one side, from the symbols to the, the colors, you got five points. 
but you had that additional criteria that allowed you to increase or decrease that point. So for example, if you plug all of the squares into the red colors, you get an additional point per, per plug. But if you plug any triangle into a purple color, you lose all of those points, for example. So these criteria were randomly generated on each iteration. And my task was to take this challenge around to the different teams, there was maybe eight teams or whatever, for them to have a go and score the best that they could score. Every single team created, uh, completed the challenge in exactly the same way, and every single team scored pretty much the same score. And what they did was they came together as a team, they planned their approach, they read the criteria, they went, well, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, oh, we can't do that, we'll do that. They made their plan, they maybe spent 15, 20 minutes planning. And then once they'd planned, they put their plan into action. And what some of the teams found was their plan wasn't quite right. So some of them tweaked their plan on the fly, some of them went, sod it, we've done the planning, let's just crack on and, and complete it, we'll do okay. But broadly speaking, they split it into two phases, plan and then, then execute and deliver. And like I say, they all did pretty well. They all scored relatively high scores. But later on that evening, one of the interns who was here with some of the guys that were running this, just a 16-year-old lad, not involved in cybersecurity in any way, shape or form, um, had a go. And his approach was completely different. He took the leads and he plugged them in and he tried all the different slots until he got the highest score and then he took the next lead and went through. And he completed that challenge in 10 minutes and scored a notably higher score than all of the other teams. So not only had he completed it quicker, he'd scored a higher score because he hadn't constrained himself to a set of rules that he'd defined at the beginning. He'd not wasted time doing the, the planning. He'd sat there and gone, well, let me crack on and try some stuff. And he'd been really successful when he'd tried some stuff. So I'm just gonna kind of reiterate the rules piece. Sometimes rules are there for a good reason, but sometimes, you know what, it's worth just challenging those. I won't dwell too much on this slide, but, but a thing that sometimes is quite prevalent in our industry, we're, we're typically a people industry, right? We use smart people to do clever things. That's quite different to a product, in the, kind of the product world. Because in the product world, you, you need a market in order to take your products to it. One thing that's really exciting about our industry and, and, and where we operate in it, to me, is we're kind of in that innovator's early adopter space because actually we can shape and change and develop the market. We don't need that market to exist yet. We can be the creators because we don't need mass market to, to, to support our businesses. Um, there's a book on this called, called Crossing the Chasm, which, if I'm honest, I've only skim read, but... This is, this is quite an important slide because I've seen this hold people back because they're sat there. I, I guess the crux of it is business works with known knowns. So if you're sat there going, I'd love to do some crazy stuff, your business pr probably won't understand that. They'll be going, well, how big's the market? And you're sat there going, well, that's the exciting thing. There's no market yet. We're going to create it. And like, watch your business sit there and try and figure that one out because it, it won't work. So these, these kind of constraints hold us back a little bit. I had tweaked this slide so it had less text on it, but I forgot to drop through the update. Um, the bullet points are the key thing on this one. So another experience I had, and I promise I will get onto some of the, what we, what every individual in this room can do to, to, to kind of progress things in a minute. But another experience I had in this, I would probably flag as being one of the most enlightening experiences I've had in management ever because I learned an awful lot firsthand by just just watching it but I had a session with my team of managers and, and, and one of the directors wanted to run a session on learning styles a guy called Ed Parsons smart smart guy so he gave us all a questionnaire that we had to complete and uh, and score ourselves against a whole bunch of different topic areas and what came out of that is you were scored in a score, I can't remember what it was between, let's say zero and 20, in each of these different areas, and you had a prevailing style. And the thing that Ed asked us to then do was to go and stand with everyone else who shared our same learning style. 
or our same prevalent learning style. And I found this a little bit awkward, if I'm honest, because I assumed I'd done something wrong, because all of mine came out very, very similar. But I'd scored slightly more in the activists, so I went and stood in the, 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 the section with the activists. And I, you know sometimes you complete a questionnaire and you're almost like, well, that's the only way to complete it. I don't know how anyone could answer differently. Well, we had four teams in the room, and they were quite evenly distributed. We had a very, very balanced team in the room, which surprised me, because I was sat there going, well, why isn't everyone in this corner? Kind of reinforcing my, well, I must have completed it, completed it wrong piece. But the next task Ed gave us, we were, I think we were planning for our company strategy day. So what Ed tasked us with was each of the groups must communicate to another group um, that they need to run strategy and strategy day and basically task them with running strategy day. So it's probably worth looking at what these different styles are before I, I cover the next bit. So activists, I would describe as, they just want to crack on and do stuff. Reflectors, they like to study a situation, learn from it, learn from past experiences. Theorists really like structures, they, they like a plan, they like an end, defined end goal and, and maybe a journey on the way. And pragmatists are described as, they just like to try stuff out and see if it works. So we as the activists, we're going to be told by the theorists, so the people who like structure, plans, end goals, to run strategy day. And they started by going, well, jokingly they said, they started by going, well, you're the activists, so just crack on and do strategy day. And you could see all of us as activists going, cool. But then they proceeded to go, but that's a little bit unfair. So, strategy day, we would like this. And, and they reverted to their style. They reverted to a defined outcome and a bunch of structure. And you could see all of us. And Ian's here laughing because he was in my team at the time. And all of us just kind of went, this is far less fun now. And, and we'd been turned off. And in that moment, I learned a hell of a lot about different people, different learning styles, and their motivations. Now, there's a real interesting piece about this, is I've shoved this questionnaire under the nose of many, many people who I think are doing absolutely stunning stuff in the industry. And there's a thing that's really consistent amongst them all, which is they all score very balanced in most areas, but they all come out as activists by maybe two, one, two, three points. So that in itself, to me, was really, really interesting. So I did want to go on the journey of kind of figuring out, well, can you cause someone to be that style, or are you a fixed style already? Um, and I won't bore you with the whole journey, but the crux of it is, yes, you can change stuff. Um, not hugely, like certainly, and I think some of you will relate to this, is new people coming in the industry often tend to be theorists because you know what? You've come in an industry and there's a hell of a lot to learn. So what you want is someone to go, well, there's some structure, learn this stuff. So we know kind of the learning styles of some of these people. Um, but what else is true of these people? And the reason for an iceberg is, you're all going to understand this, but people that you see doing great stuff, what you're seeing is the end result of that stuff that they've done. And actually, they don't really care about the end result because to them, the journey was the piece. And you might have seen this sometimes when you compliment someone on some work they've done or whatever, and they brush it off a little bit because actually that thing that you've read, that, they didn't care about that. They just documented that at the end. It was all the, the trials and tribulations and the things they learnt along the way. That was the journey. To them, that was the piece they were focused on. So reason for the iceberg is obviously what you see is a very small part of what these, what these people are, are working on. But there were a few other notable kind of things that I'd observed. One of them was they liked to do all of their research in their own time. They don't really bother with formal structured training. They have blooming massive to-do lists and their learning styles as we're documented. And that's a little bit awkward, right? 
because we as businesses are sat there going, well, we need to support people in doing all of this great stuff. Let's give them time. And they don't want that time. We need to give them training. That's, that's not what they want. Um, massive to-do lists. You bang on about time management. Don't have a massive to-do list. But actually, that's what works for them. And then there's the learning styles piece as well. So I thought it'd be super interesting to delve into that awkwardness a little bit, I suppose. And I guess what it boiled down to is if you're trying to do something new within your workplace, you've got a natural draw and bias to the stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you come up with a great new concept or idea, your only place to benchmark it or test it is in what you do day-to-day. -day. So if what you do day-to-day is a circle, and you've gone and created a square, no matter how hard you try, that square isn't going to fit through that circle hole. And eventually, you're going to round off the corners, and you'll have a circle, and you're back to where you are. So you've not been able to take that huge leap in creativity. A huge part of it is also, to them, this is a hobby. And they're doing their hobby at home, and they're going to shape their work life by bringing their hobby to work. So crack on, do their research, and you know what? I'm going to use my company as a forum to present it at different conferences or publish the, the, the vulnerabilities or whatever it is you've looked at. Um, so that's all cool, but it's, it's a little bit of an awkward one because we want everyone to have the same opportunities, the same opportunity to do great research. And if you're a parent with a couple of kids, you know what, you probably don't have that free time to be doing this all in your own time. So I've been exploring this one a little bit myself because I, I don't have that free time anymore. And there is a mechanism that I've, I've found actually works relatively well too, which is, well, you've got a circle, a circle hole. Can you turn that into a square first? Because if you can turn it into a square, then you can create a square to put through the square without having to round off the corners and turn it into a circle. So to put that in less of an analogy, if you can shape your work and what you're doing to be something else, you need to do something else in order to deliver that something else. And that starts to give you a situation within your working environment. You can change uh, the, the way things are working. It's certainly not trivial or easy. There's lots of things like I could give a blooming whole hour-long presentation on stuff that's worked and stuff that hasn't worked on this topic. But that's kind of the, the, the raw premise of it. They don't bother with or want training. They learn by doing. So for them, the journey is more important than the, than the end result. And, and why this works really well for them is, if I said to you, how did your computer get that IPv6 address? You could Google, how did my computer get that IPv6 address? And you get the answer. But if you fired up Wireshark and watched the traffic to see how your computer got that IPv6 address, a valid question you would then have is, well, what if I sent those router advertisements myself? And then suddenly you've learned something new, but also you've got something else to look into. So you're starting to add new tasks and answer more questions as you go on your journey. Which is why you then see them with massive to-do lists, because they've got a whole host of questions that they want to answer. And for, for them, it initially starts with a kind of breadth over depth. You're kind of hedging your bets a bit. If you're looking at lots of things, your chances of finding something interesting are actually increased. But if you're going, I'm going to look at this one very specific thing, well, if that doesn't give any fruit or it's a bit tough or a bit challenging, you're quite committed to that. And that's going to take an awful lot of time to, to kind of overcome. So you're hedging. Equally, having a massive list causes it to self-prioritize, because you're only going to bother with the things on the list that interest you, and other stuff will start to become less interesting and dip down the list. Um, so it self-prioritizes. But the number one thing that I hear from people when I ask them, well, why aren't you cracking on doing that exciting research? It boils down to, I don't have time. And in with, within my companies, I've tried I'm going to go everything that's possible to get people the time. I've booked the time out, made the time available. We've even given people lists of things. We'll try this, try that, do this bit of research. But, but in reality, none of, them, none of them work. If you set an objective for someone, 
that removes the creativity. If you set a defined do this, your creativity is gone. That's the, 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 the complete opposite of how a creative brain works. There's a, there's a, piece, there's a, there's a topic, I, I came across it as the bike shed problem, but it's also referred to as Parkinson's law of triviality. But the story I'd heard was you had a, a nuclear power plant and they had an important meeting with two topics they want, well, multiple topics they wanted to cover, but one was something I don't know, complicated about fuel rods or whatever. They spent 10 minutes discussing that, made a decision and moved on. Next topic was where on site should they place the bike sheds? And they discussed that for the rest of the meeting because that's a topic that everyone can get involved with. There's no bar to entry. We can all throw in an opinion. So it's an easy topic. So the only way to get people working on topics that is to reduce that bar to entry. So keep your tasks super simple on your to-do list because if you've got a massive thing that could essentially be a PhD thesis, you know what? You've got to build up the momentum, book out all the time, etc., etc., to do it. But if you've got stuff that's just a whole list of things that take five, ten minutes to do, it's super easy to crack on and do them, and that bar to entry kind of disappears. I'm talking a little bit quick because I'm overrunning a reasonable amount. Most of my slides tend to be pictures because I'm not very good at putting together bullet points and, and, uh, and the like. But I did want to give people a slide that's actually useful to take away. So I put together this table of things that actually you, everyone in this room, can do right now. I imagine some of you are doing some of these things already, which is, which is awesome. And I imagine there's some things that aren't on this list that you guys can tell me later that, that really work for you and your teams that I'd love to learn about as well. The first thing, to-do lists. If you haven't jotted it down, you know what, you're going to forget about it. But jot things down, go and explore it. You will have more questions than you have answers when you go and explore that topic. And your to-do list will balloon and balloon and balloon. And it will self-prioritize itself. Cover some breadth. Don't focus on one thing. So kind of hedge your, hedge your bets across a whole bunch of stuff. And stop planning. Stop sitting there. This is the output that I want. Because you're going on a journey. And the journey is the fun bit. That's where you're going to learn your stuff. And if you can picture the output already, my question to you would be, is it innovative enough then? Is it innovation if you know what the end output looks like? Because you can picture it already. Uh, go find answers rather than look up answers. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of a tendency at the moment to just acquire lots of knowledge. Well, you can acquire that knowledge by going and playing with things too. And that's the thing that, that, that creates a lot more questions. More of a kind of business one, but I have a lot of techies who, who go, well, to justify me spending time doing this, this is what the end product could look like, and this is how we could make money out of it. And that never works. Just don't do that. Do it because it's fun. Do it because you're going to enjoy it. Do it because you're going to learn stuff about it. But also talk about it because, like today, like you get overload chatting with lots of smart people about ideas, things that they're focused on. And that just bubbles through new ideas. It helps you explore and challenge some of your concepts and debate those things with them. Uh, ask why. Focus on the outcome, not the output, because that will help you, you know, go in a direction. And also to the point about freeing up time at work. If you're sat there on a project, you could go through this checklist of things, or you could find out why they're engaging you in the first place, because you might well find that most of that checklist of stuff they don't really need. They just want confidence that you have said, it looks all right. So, yeah, just really wrapping up now. Like him or hate him, Peter Thiel said something that I think is, is probably some awesome advice to, to share with everyone. The next Bill Gates will not build an operating system. The next Larry Page or Sergey Brin won't make a search engine. And the next Mark Zuckerberg won't create a social network. If you're copying them, you're not learning from them. And I'd kind of extend that a little bit further and say, we haven't solved cybersecurity yet. So if you're coming into the industry or if you're in the industry and you're just following in someone else's footsteps, that's, that's a long journey that you're going to go just play and catch up with someone else. Go carve your own pathway. Go do something new that, that interests you, because that's probably the thing the industry needs. We're not going to solve cybersecurity by doing more of what we've done before. 
it might help us, but there's got to be something new. And I think you guys are probably the guys to go, go shape it, go find it. That is it from me, actually quite nicely on time.